Trujillo family. I am so excited to have the filmmakers of a film that we are executive producing at Trujillo and, um, and really is, these two are my dear friends. Uh, they've become friends. Jonathan was a longtime friend. We grew up together in Cambridge and Ladata is now a dear friend and I'm, I'm uh, so excited to introduce you to them and to talk about the film Invented Before You Were Born. So let's start with Jonathan because the story kind of starts with you and then we'll go to Ladata and then we'll jump into more on the film. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Fanchon. Um, and I'm so excited to be part of the Trujillo family. That's an amazing much place to be. I'm really <laughs> excited. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan. Um, uh, I'll go with uh, what we do in uh, Surge when we have meetings, an organization I'm part of, which is uh, say that I go with he, him pronouns. Um, I identify as white and European American. Um, and yeah, I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, it was a diverse community, uh, had a lot of economic and racial diversity and ethnic diversity in the community. Um, but at the same time, it also had a lot of division and a lot of, uh, you know, disparity of privilege. And um, so I grew up observing that. Um, and, uh, but later in life, I just found myself more and more, uh, I'd say more and more surrounded by white people and that was like, I, I didn't know exactly why that was, um, but it just seemed to be happening more and more where I lived and where I was in my career, working in film particularly. Um, and, um, and so there was a lot of questions about that. And then there was just a lot of stuff happening in the world that was really bringing all this to the forefront, um, which kind of led uh, some members of my family my sister really spearheaded this and brought me in very early about really examining our own identity and our own past and and where we came from and how that influenced everything in the society, in American society, how that had a real, you know, it was really in the roots of all this stuff that was happening. And, um, and yeah, and through examining that, that led us down a path to really looking at stuff that would, happened with our ancestors and um, yeah, it, 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 we kind of fell into this story. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, and, and the beginning of the film kind of talks about your journey. And then you meet this incredible woman who was studying the part of your family's history. Uh, right. So Ladata, will you tell us about who you are and how you got involved? Sure. So I am Lee Data, Denise Grimes, and when it comes to identifiers, something that has always stuck with me is that I am a pretty much a fat black girl with glasses in America. Mm. And, you know, mm. if you break, a pe or break apart each one of those identifiers, it should say a lot. Um, I'm also a journalist, a historian, and an educator. And so while working on my PhD studies, I, I found this story. And this story fascinated me because it wasn't the typical story of uh, slavery and uh, degradation. Um, that is part of it, but it's not the end of the story. And so that fascinated me so much so that I didn't originally believe it was true mm -hmm. um, until I got a chance to look at the papers myself and look at the wheel myself and, um, you know, and, and meet these descendants of this story. And so, like I said, I was working on it for my PhD uh, studies and all of a sudden I get an email out of the blue, <laughs> you know, from a filmmaker who says that, hey, I'm a descendant of Richard Bibb and I'd like to uh, tell this story. And again, you know, disbelief, like, really, this is spam. <laughs> but uh, Jonathan uh, Knight is a real person and, um, you know, the story itself is real. And so I'm honored to be a part of telling this story that all of the descendants of this story are very uh, real, uh, incredible human mm. beings that we get to meet on this journey. Um, the people in Russellville, um, the care and the um, that they've exhibited over this story, the way they've shepherded for over uh, shepherded, you know, for over 30 years with mm -hmm. nobody telling this story mm -hmm. is uh, real important. And so I'm really excited to be about uh, telling people's stories. That's been a passion my entire life since I was a child. 
uh, I've always wanted to um, tell people stories. Uh, a new part of uh, the adventure for me is asking the question, how do we afford all people humanity? And mm -hmm. that is something that uh, black people in this country have been robbed of for far too long. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my work um, deals with how do we afford black people in history and now um, humanity and uh, by extension, all people humanity. Ooh. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that says everything about certainly why I was drawn to this project. Um, and, and Jonathan had to chase me down for a little bit. And, <laughs> and then and, and I'll be honest, I had some some misgivings about a white mm -hmm. man, you know, kind of uh, telling a story about enslaved folks and about black folks. And um, and so it took a little bit, but let's reveal what the, what the catalyst of, what is the spark of this story. So we've mentioned Bib. Jonathan, do you wanna kind of reveal what, what is this kind of unique and special story? Well, what was uh, immediately unique to me when I read it, um, and, I, and I read it in a piece of a paragraph and a half or so that my grandmother had written down. Uh, she passed away when I was uh, about six years old, so, um, I, I found this in, in the attic and it was like a dusty old booklet that she had written and she had done the, some of this research herself and she found this story and she, and she said that, you know, Richard Bibb was our descendant, or our ancestor, sorry, and, um, and he had freed the slaves that he owned, right? This was the headline and then it was like, you know, he freed all these slaves. So he was like this good guy, right? And he kind of made you know, the, the story, she didn't write a lot about his parents, or, you know, and grandparents who owned slaves. Mm -hmm. He did, she didn't write about uh, his own children who owned slaves, but it was, it was about him because he freed the slaves. So, you know, that and, was her take on it. To, I think it's important to say when he freed the slaves, like what, yeah. at what time, right? So yeah. this was in 1839 when he passed away. And this, so this is uh, decades before the civil war. Um, and so, um, and that story is remarkable and worth looking at for sure. But when you look a little bit deeper, the next level of it is that he left uh, people with land and money. And, um, and as Lee Data has always firmly uh, reminded everyone, they earned that money. It was rightfully at, their at money. Least, yeah. It was not a gift of generosity, it was a payback for generations of labor. Um, but they had this, this uh, amount of wealth left to them and they used it to create communities. And the remarkable thing is with a little bit of research, we found that the communities uh, persevered for, for generations mm -hmm. and that there were still remnants of these communities still existing in Kentucky. Uh, which to me was like, okay, we have to go to Kentucky and we have to find out more about that because that's counter to everything you kind of learn in history. Uh, it's counter to all the narratives, um, both the narratives of slavery as well as the post-slavery narratives mm -hmm. of, you know, basically, you know, itinerant sharecroppers and, and mm -hmm. people living at the whim of, you know, racist white Southerners. And so this story was like the story of empowerment and self-determination. Yes. Um, and then really, that was what drew us to Kentucky to, to go deeper into it. But the thing we found very early on when we got to Kentucky was th this next little bit was that it turned out that my ancestor fathered a lot of the people he enslaved mm -hmm. and uh, probably his father did as well. Yeah. And generations of this, you know, raping of black women. Uh, and the result of that is that many of the descendants of the enslaved people are related to me. They're my cousins. Um, and so and I'm going to stop you there, Jonathan, and ask Lidata, wh what was it like to now um, re interact with the folks, one that you had been reading about, right, and kind mm -hmm. of studying about, but now actually mm -hmm. interacting with the contemporary mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, lives of those who had been so deeply affected by by enslavement, like mm -hmm. all of us, but also mm -hmm. this decision by Bib. Mm -hmm. Well, my first question was, what story did they want to tell? You know, and the way this story has originally come forth is that uh, Richard Bibb, um, you know, this civil, not, not civil war, revolutionary war hero, you know, he um, lived, he was a minister, he owned all this land, very rich, very well respected during his time. Um, in his will, he frees those uh, slaves that he owned. He also participated in the uh, colonization movement. Well, he, sleeves, he frees these enslaved black people, I should say, instead of slaves. Uh, he frees them, and like Jonathan said, he's given them this, these land, these houses, and some, you know, and money, uh, farm animals, tools, equipment. And with that money, they establish three free black towns. Um, a lot of the emphasis has been just on Major Richard Bibb and what he did. My work is about talking about those those black people who established those three free black uh, communities yes. um, who were afforded power, you know, prior to the Civil War, who were afforded their freedom and emancipation well prior to the Civil War. So what does it mean to be free, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, you know, what's fascinating to me is that we see one of the women, you know, go from enslavement to freedom to owning her own cake business. And you see it all in the historical records. When you go deeper into the uh, census records, you see that they are landowners, um, they have businesses, they uh, and they have a net worth of like $1,000 in 1840, 18, you know, in the 1850s, you know, well prior to uh, the Civil War again. And so, that agency is what my work is about. That uh, agenda is what my work is about. And far too often, we, we only talk about the enslavement of black people. Right. But we don't talk about the ways in which they, you know, overcame uh, slavery, which we like know to be resourceful a social AF. Exactly. <laughs> Resilient, you know, resourceful. On yeah. steroids. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to maintain, you know, that wealth and that land and, you know, the, in the letters that you see them writing, you also see them questioning as this land and these resources are parceled out to them. You know, you see questions like, oh, well, such and such seem to have gotten a better piece of land than me, mm -hmm. you know, or as, you know, certain things were sold off, they would question and say, okay, where's my money? Mm -hmm. You know, I want to, you know, I want it. And so they were not... Um, you know, they were not objects. They weren't property. Um, they still lived in a circumscribed society, but they were asserting their full humanity. They were asserting their citizenship mm. all along mm. the way. Mm. And you just have to look for it. Yes. You know? Um, you mentioned, and, and uh, Jonathan, maybe start with this and Lida to add on the, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of a colonization initiative mm -hmm. that you touch on in the film that I think a lot of us don't know, including those of us who have direct heritage. So Jonathan, will you, will you talk about that? Right. So, um, so Richard Bibb was an advocate of the colonization society in Kentucky, mm -hmm. particularly. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an organization and a, and a movement to uh, repatriate black Americans to Africa. Right. Um, so it was, you know, it's a very complicated, uh, you know, thing to sort out in terms of motivations. It was, it was participated in by people who would be considered abolitionists. There are people who thought that the institution of slavery should end, yet it also was, uh, but go do it somewhere. <laughs> Right. But they were still very much white supremacists and they're mm -hmm. very much that, you know, the United States of America should be a white country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so um, so it's a you know, it's both a you know, you could look at it from being a slightly enlightened point of view, but also as a very uh, paternalistic point of view. Mm -hmm. And so what Richard Bibb specifically did was prior to writing his will, um, and I guess post the point in which he had had this revelation that he decided that slavery was uh, wrong, um, he organized and he spent money or, uh, he, um, organizing this entire endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, and he took about, uh, I think, close to half of the people he enslaved at the time. Uh, it was about 50 or 60 individuals. And he uh, 
and he formally emancipated them. But he said, here, you know, basically, here's your ticket to Liberia. And he put them onto, uh, onto wagons, and they were um, carried on wagons to New Orleans, I believe, is where the ship uh, was docked. Wow. And uh, they were put on these ships. And they were. We've, they uh, to... we've experienced something like that recently, where folks mm. were shipped off to another place and told that they were going to enjoy, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, very much a uh, very uh, paternalistic and very much uh, taking away their agency. Um, and then, and the terrible result was that uh, the crossing to Africa was, uh, they were hit with cholera and a large number of them died mm. on the ships. Uh, some of them died very soon after arriving in Africa. A few did survive. And an amazing story we heard when we were talking to one of the descendants, one of the black descendants was that, um, I guess a, a few years ago, uh, one of the black descendants living in, in Kentucky um, received a letter from Africa, from Liberia. And they said, we've got some land here that your cousin left to you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, there were some descendants who did survive and wow. did end up thriving in, mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. But, uh, part two, invented part yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really just want to add that there's a place in Liberia known as Kentucky, Liberia. Wow, and so, I didn't know that. Is that yes. in the film? And I should have known that. We'll cut that part. Oh. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so a very important person in this film is Michael Morrow. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So Lidad, I want to ask you to kind of start by talking about him and his contributions to the film and, and to Russellville. Yeah, so Michael Morrow is an incredible local historian and um, I can't say enough. No, when you meet Michael, when you um, just, just, just get to know Michael, his heart for this story and his heart for the community, you know, mm. it is uh, it's something um, I want to say you don't see it often, but I believe you actually do see it often. And, and there are these local historians who are just passionate about preserving the history, who mm -hmm. go to the archives on a daily basis and just read. And, you know, they know where all of the documents are. And so I was a student when I first called Michael Morrow and asked for help. And he invited me down to Russellville. <laughs> I remember sitting in his back office, uh, you know, just looking through. Uh, his personal research, you know, and him pointing me to historical documents, and he's done that for myself and tons of other students. And uh, this 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 story was his baby for over thirty years, you know. And uh, he 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 has, like I said, shepherded this story. He along with Joe Grant Clark, who is over uh, the Seek Museum, yes. and uh, is it historical historic Russellville? And, uh, you know, they've been instrumental in bringing this story to the forefront. And what's exciting about this community is that they use this story as a, uh, a source of racial healing. You know, yes. they have the Sikh Museum and, you know, Joe Grant says that Sikh is a verb, you know, mm -hmm. Sikh freedom. You know, uh, what are some of those other things? Seek, <laughs> you know, he said it's a verb of the mind. Seek knowledge. Seek knowledge, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, um, wonderful, wonderful place. And it's a tiny little town in Western Kentucky, but it is uh, just overflowing with this story and mm. a ton of others, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. what's so incredible about that place. And so I'm praying that this, uh, the film gets out there and that uh, people are inspired to, you know, dig into this history, find out if you're connected to this story somehow. Yes. And if yes. nothing else, you know, take a visit to the uh, Seek Museum or uh, support it online and, uh, you know, look for that story in your community that uh, ignites your passions mm -hmm. and pushes you to do the work of restoration and affording all people humanity. Mm. Jonathan, do you want to yeah. add about what it meant for, for Michael to be involved in the film and the Sikh Museum and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's one of the luckiest things that's happened to me is mm -hmm. to be able to meet Michael, um, you know, and, and, and consider him a friend and um, just have an ongoing relationship uh, with 
him and with the museum and with the efforts going on there, it's just really unique. It's, I've, I've never seen anything like it. He's dedicated himself fully and whole, you know, every part of himself to this, uh, you know, and it's a multifaceted uh, project for him. You know, it's the history that he is documenting and, and is the master of. It's the, um, it's the museum and what that does for the community and, and raising the, the profile of the community as well as, uh, you know, being a way of bringing people and bringing resources into the community. Yeah. But it's also what he does for children. You know, he, mm -hmm. he has programs that he runs mm -hmm. um, that are just like, you know, ongoing, continuous programs that, that mm -hmm. offer ways for teenagers to make money you know, he pays, mm -hmm. pays these, these mm -hmm. young men to come work for him. He does educational tutoring. He gets them interested in, in the uh, history. He told me a story. Cause one of the things that he does in the summer times is, you know, he takes uh, these, this group of, of young men to uh, the archives and he has them work on sorting through all these historical documents that have been mm -hmm. collected over the years. And, uh, you know, and they're sorting through newspaper clippings and old photographs mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, all these kind of artifacts that have just been collected. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told a story that one there was one kid who was like, you know, I don't I don't get this. Why you make us do this? You know, why do I want to be reading newspaper articles? I don't you know, I don't get it. And then he picked one up and he said, hey, Michael, did you see that this says that Muhammad Ali what descended from a bib <laughs> and michael's all yeah yeah you should read more about it and that <laughs> kid spent the rest of the week sorting newspaper articles about muhammad ali right mm -hmm. and you know and that was the spark and that's mm -hmm. michael's entire approach you know he creates mm -hmm. the spark mm -hmm. and uh you know it's just that's i think what why mm -hmm. he does it absolutely mm -hmm. um the film builds to this amazing moving event mm -hmm. um and uh and so I, yeah i'd love to have you talk about where it takes place why it takes place um and kind of what we can take away from witnessing and almost feeling like what i love about the film is like it feels like we're there it really feels like mm -hmm. we're participating in this event so um jonathan i'll have you start uh, around yeah, how did this come to be and and um, what do you hope for us to take away from being part of the event? Well, so again, this is really the brainchild of Michael Morrow. Um, and early on uh, when we were talking to him, he, he mentioned it. It was not something we knew was coming when we first started the film. He said, you know, I've been wanting to do a reunion and get the, the black descendants and the white descendants together and bring them back to to the house in Russellville and, you know, just see how they interact with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can see we even have an archival uh, interview that he did with uh, Marilyn Gill, who uh, was one of the last living descendants on the land in Bibtown. Yes. And that was done, that was an interview done um, uh, in 2010. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and he mentions the reunion then. So it's been on his mind and in his plans for, for a very long time. And, um, and so when we first heard about it, you know, we expressed, I expressed to him that I definitely would want to be there. And I thought that was a great idea. Um, but privately, I think we talked amongst ourselves. I think we talked, Lee Dada and I, Rachel, we said, you know, I really hope he can get this together, but you know, I don't really know if it's going to be a success, you know, and, and I didn't know, I didn't think that actually very many white descendants would come mm. because in my opinion, I just thought that most, most white people aren't particularly interested mm. in this kind of thing. Mm. And so I thought it would be a stretch to really get people to attend. Um, but uh, he organized it. He and Gran got it together. They got a date set and they they uh, michael has a database of descendants that he has found through all kinds of means mm -hmm. like going to uh to graveyards in illinois and mm -hmm. and searching on databases mm -hmm. in texas and 
all these places where Bib descendants have, have moved to over the last 150 years. And so he has this database and he just sent out invitations far and wide. Mm -hmm. And um, come the date, you know, that he that the, mm -hmm. that it happened, this reunion, mm -hmm. there was just a tremendous turnout. Yeah. Um, and there was people uh, from both sides, the white side and the black side who came and never had met each other, mm -hmm. um, had coming for the same reasons because they were interested in this history um, mm -hmm. and and beginning to get to know each other. Uh, it was an incredibly meaningful event. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad that you say that, um, that it really felt like you were there in the film because mm -hmm. I have to credit one of the reasons I think that's true is that we had um, people filming at the reunion who were actually personally involved mm -hmm. in the story. So we had mm -hmm. um, a Bib descendant mm -hmm. uh, who was um, uh, doing filming yes. for the film. Yes. And um, we actually had two. And so- um, Wonderful. Wonderful. That, I think that really- that, That's what did it. <laughs> really it right. makes the, the footage so personal because Which, and it goes full circle back to Lidata what you said around mm -hmm. what was important was what do you, what is the story you want to tell and mm -hmm. so they actually had their hand in telling mm -hmm. this this part mm -hmm. of the story mm -hmm. Lidata did you want to add anything about kind of that piece of the event or um, anything else that you've experienced in, in getting to know this community um, the event was uh, phenomenal you know, it, it was one of those things where um, it wasn't high tech. It wasn't a lot of uh, seminars or, you know, workshop kind of thing or, you know, lectures. But it was led by Tracy. Yeah. Tracy just really uh, touched the pulse of the moment. Yeah. Yeah. She stood on the steps of uh, Richard Bibb's former home, which still stands today. And... Um, it was it was an just a moment where she, you know, spoke truthfully and honestly mm -hmm. to the uh, to the moment. You know, you'll hear her say in the film that she wasn't there for Richard Bibb. You know, she was there for those people who lived upstairs, which were those formerly enslaved people. You know, and we you know we take you into the that attic. You know, in the film, and yes. um, you know, uh, it was not a contentious uh, meeting. Uh, you know, I did hear some, you know, some anger, some raised voices at points, but it wasn't that largely. It was a lot of people trying to understand, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, some challenges were made, you know, that, you know, we're not coming back here, you know, for the same old, same old, you know, we're here, you know, to see what are you doing mm -hmm. about racial injustice mm -hmm. in this country. You know, this is not just a cute, static story. Mm -hmm. You know, this is very much about activism, mm -hmm. you know, and we're not here for, uh, you know, we're not here to, you know, just commemorate. Mm -hmm. Performative, this we're not, this is not gonna exactly. be Exactly, thank, mm -hmm. thank you, thank mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I enjoyed meeting everybody that was there, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, from the local people who are descendants, from those who came in from, you know, out of town to, uh, you know, and everybody's in different places in this in this uh, fight against uh, racism and for equity and equality. And uh, everybody's story was important, I think. And, um, you know, everybody's story, I, I hope, you know, was heard and captured. I love it. Wow. So what are your hopes for the film? What, so far, you've garnered uh, an award at one of the film festivals. You've also, we're, we're I think, a good three, three beautiful laurels in um, and so much <laughs> more to go. Um, so kind of what are, your, what are your hopes around accolades? Because by the way, you deserve it. So even though this is an important and impactful mm -hmm. story, you both have put in a lot of work. I mm -hmm. was there for a quarter of it. You, you mm -hmm. all did so much before Trudeau mm -hmm. came in and, and, and will continue to. So um, you can talk about what you hope those kinds of things will be for the film and then also what kind of impact do you want the film to have? So we'll start with you, Lidata. 
I want to see people, uh, you know, find their space in the conversation and move to activism. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we don't need any more just great stories. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need any more tears. We don't need any more, um, you know, uh, prayers and well wishes. Um, always open for prayers. Don't get me wrong. Because uh, I've said many times, I do believe this is spiritual work. Mm. Um, I do believe that those uh, once enslaved people prayed to be heard, to be acknowledged, to be uh, fully recognized for their humanity. And, um, you know, I believe uh, that not one prayer falls to the ground before God. And that this is, in some way, those prayers being answered. And, um, you know, so I want to see us move, you know. I want to see us, I want to see people look at the documentary and find their place in it. And this, you know, for me, this is a work of justice all around. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't a one-time thing. We've been back to Russellville, yes. you know. The, uh, the church on the grounds of the, uh, those grounds that were first given to those uh, formerly enslaved uh, black people. Um, has been redone mm -hmm. and that is um, you know something that we wanted to be very intentional about not just walking into a community and robbing it of its story of its social capital but making sure that you know that we left an imprint you know and a commitment to do more and uh, I pray that other people will do the same mm -hmm. thank you Jonathan yeah, I mean, I'll echo, echo that. That's really, um, I think, the key thing is is we were challenged immediately when we came to Russellville. Um, I was personally challenged, my sister and and I, about like, what were we there to do? Mm -hmm. Are we there to take some story that belongs mm -hmm. to someone else and like go mm -hmm. become famous using it or or make mm -hmm. money off of it? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and we had to, you know, uh, really talk about what our motivations were. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really glad that, that we've been able to uh, really maintain that trust and earn that trust, I think, um, and uh, become uh, part, of, um, part of what's happening with the museum, part of what's happening with the revitalizing the church there. Um, an ongoing commitment that I feel very strongly about towards that community and, mm -hmm. and the community of descendants broadly. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, getting selected for festivals has been amazing. I'm really, mm -hmm. uh, that feels great. I think winning awards is, feels amazing and I'm really grateful for that. Um, but the thing that's uh, really gratifying in the long run is the fact that we've had some screenings now, you know, we're rolling it out. Um, the screenings are starting, they're, they're accelerating. Um, the reaction that we've been getting has been amazing. Yes. And one of the things that happens at every screening that I've been at, um, which is uh, three now in front of audiences, um, the first one we had in Russellville, we brought it there first for the premiere. Yes. Uh, we showed it to the community there. We got a tremendous uh, reception. Uh, we had um, people coming up to us afterwards saying, you know, I saw myself there. I saw myself on screen. I saw my community. This is my home up on the screen, uh, which is what we hoped. We hoped that we could uh, present uh, something that was real. Um, and then uh, in subsequent uh, screenings that we've had, we've just had these conversations start afterwards that are so deep and so, uh, you know, insightful come you know i i i'm nervous when i stand up after this film has been shown and i think you know i go in front of an audience and all and i say you know are there any questions and i think i'm going to get crickets or like you know maybe i'm going to have to try and come up with something to talk about for 5 minutes and then say thank everyone for being there mm -hmm. but no hands shoot up every time hands shoot up and people have questions and they want to talk about it and they want it. And, I, you know, and I spent, uh, um, you know, I've, I've spent time after the film in the in the uh, lobby of the theater just talking with people. And it's and they everybody wants to talk about it after they see this film. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to start conversations. We want to 
get these, you know, tough questions, often very tough questions. Um, but that's the whole point is to get the conversation started. So get it seems to be effective. Move to action, as Lee Dyer yeah. said. And, and I have to say, this is why you two make such a great team on this film. Um, I'm so proud to be in any way connected. I'm so excited for the future of what this means and and the actions that can happen, the impact that this film is going to have. And I just want to thank you both so, so much for all of your hard work. It's, it's, um, it's so important. So thank you. <laughs> thank, oh, you thank you, Fetch. Thank you for what you do. And we know that you're very much a part of the work of uh, equity as well. And so thank you for coming mm -hmm. on board. I appreciate, appreciate you more than you know. Uh, and you know what? Mm -hmm. I realized I should be calling you Dr. Grimes through this whole thing. We should we should mention yeah, that. Through, yeah. By the way, throughout the whole thing, you were also finishing up your PhD program. So yeah, yeah. congratulations mm -hmm. and yeah. Um, yeah. All right, Trujillo family, that was our incredible interview with my friends uh, and filmmakers, yeah. Lidata Grimes, Dr. Lidata Grimes, and Jonathan Knight. And we can't wait to share the film with you. Go to the website at www.bibfilm.com, and that's B-I-B-B-film.com. Mm -hmm. You can follow on Instagram as at bibfilm, B-I-B-B-film. Yes. And mm -hmm. I think we're on Twitter as well, is that right? at yeah. BIBB film as well. And, um, and also let us know if you're interested in bringing a screening to you. There will be screening mm -hmm. opportunities and educational materials and, and, um, and opportunities mm -hmm. to meet with Jonathan and Lidata. All right, mm -hmm. everybody. Talk to Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Great to talk with you.